Hi, my name is Jesse Horton. I'm with Cowboys of the Cross. And Scott and I thought it would be important for me to uh, take a few moments to address an issue that we think is very, very important to uh, people understanding their salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that it is by grace through faith that we are saved and not of any works that we do, lest we should boast. Uh, I think the problem comes from when we try to mix those two, when we try to mix uh, works righteousness with uh, the grace of the cross of Christ. Uh, we can't add anything to the grace of Jesus. Uh, anytime we say that salvation is Jesus plus baptism or Jesus plus baptism and obedience to the law, uh, which is a Mormon ideology, uh, it just it completely defeats the purpose of grace. Uh, if we could earn our salvation, then Jesus died in vain. Uh, so what I want us to understand is the difference between grace and a legalistic view of works righteousness. I'm going to start by pulling a couple of verses from John chapter 4. And uh, this is verses 10 and 11. Uh, Jesus has met a woman from Samaria at the well uh, that Jacob dug. And it's in the middle of the day. The well is very deep. And uh, Jesus tells the woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And what Jesus is trying to tell her is that he is the living water. His spirit poured out upon her uh, would spring up in her eternal life. And uh, if we follow that logic, then the bucket that she needs to draw from that living water uh, would be the words that he's speaking to her. And again, the problem is that uh, when we mix legalism and grace, what we wind up with is a bucket with holes in it. Uh, so we might dip that bucket deep down into this well and try and crank it up just as fast as we can. Uh, but by the time we get it to the top, it winds up empty because we haven't worked hard enough uh, to earn that living water, and we never can. Uh, so uh, that's a good analogy for us to start with. And what I want to move on to now is Paul's letter to the Galatians. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to chapter 3 of Galatians, um, I'll explain a little bit in context uh, Paul's letter. Um, all of Paul's letters have a very specific form. Uh, we see initially the introduction where Paul introduces himself, and then secondly, uh, a prayer. Uh, but then uh, we usually get uh, some thankfulness in that prayer, but uh, we don't get that in this letter. Uh, Paul goes immediately into a scathing rebuke uh, saying that he's very, very astonished that they've turned so quickly from the gospel of grace to the gospel of works righteousness, which is a false gospel. Uh, let's read chapter 3. Uh, we'll start with verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? So, moving on, verse 7 says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Um, Paul goes on to say that, uh, everyone who relies on the law is uh, cursed. Uh, 
says that if you choose to obey the law as a means for your salvation, that you are indebted to obey the whole law, not just little bits and pieces here and there, but the whole entire law. And the problem is that nobody can do that, and that's why we need grace. And anytime we try to add works to grace, uh, we pervert the gospel of Christ. And uh, Paul uh, has some pretty um, uh, admonishing language for the people who do so. Uh, he's speaking specifically of circumcision um, because they, the Judaizers were coming in behind him to the churches at Galatia and convincing the men there that uh, it's great that you believe in Jesus, but you also need to be circumcised. Otherwise, you're not really saved and you're not going to go to heaven. Um, and Paul basically tells those guys, hey, if you're going to pervert the gospel of Christ over circumcision, then I wish you would just go the whole way and emasculate yourselves. Uh, so Paul stood very, very firmly against legalism of any kind. And that's what I want to do here today. I don't want to stand against a specific person. I don't want to stand against a specific uh, legalistic tradition. I want to stand against legalism in its entirety uh, as it opposes the gospel of Christ and grace that is given to us uh, so that we might have faith in Jesus. Uh, so let's talk about uh, righteousness through works, uh, which is what we'll call legalism. Uh, circumcision is the obedience uh, to the law that Abraham was commanded uh, whenever he uh, believed God. That was credited to him as righteousness, and he had not yet been circumcised. So his circumcision came after that. Um, and what I want you to see there is that his obedience to the law is a response to the faith that he had in Christ. Uh, his obedience to the law did not produce his faith. His faith produced his obedience to the law. Um, we see that uh, continued in Galatians. Uh, chapter 5 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, fruits are obviously the result of the planting of a seed and that seed germinating and growing. Uh, so uh, again, we see that continued theme that works are in response to to faith. Remember that works in response to faith. Uh, some examples of legalism uh, in the context of the Old Testament. There's there are so many examples here. Um, we could talk about um, seafood and pork. Um, Jewish people uh, in the Old Testament, uh, when they were leaving Egypt and going into the Promised Land, they were forbidden to eat seafood and pork. Could you imagine a life not ever eating shrimp? Um, but there was a very specific reason that God had this in mind. Uh, if you want to think of it in context, you've got a million plus Israelite men plus their wives and children, and uh, they're all traveling, wandering through the desert, camping out in tents basically for 40 years. Uh, they have no means of food preservation and no means uh, to properly cook such foods. Um, pork contains the trichinosis bacteria, and obviously seafood can uh, leave you with a good case of the runs if, if not cooked or uh, uh, preserved properly. Um, basically what God's trying to do is keep his people from dying of dysentery, which is basically diarrhea. Uh, we could also talk about garments of two different types of cloth. Um, tattoos. Uh, tattoos is another one of those issues. Uh, if you take it out of context, uh, you can make it mean whatever you want to, but in its context, uh, the, the Canaanite people that the Israelites were going to conquer and take over their land, uh, some of those tribes, some of those peoples, they used tattoos uh, as an act of worship to their little g gods. Uh, so God did not want them to participate in that kind of worshipful act uh, so that they wouldn't stray from the true worship of the true God, Yahweh. Other traditional religious practices can, uh, can pose forms of legalism for us. Uh, we could talk about uh, women wearing pants uh, to church or makeup, uh, neither of which should ever be a reason for someone to be prohibited from hearing the word of Christ. Uh, the gospel should never be uh, staggered in such a way uh, 
especially by something as silly as a pair of blue jeans. Um, we could talk about Catholicism. Uh, they pray the rosary, they do uh, penance, uh, uh, they confess, confess their sins to a priest, uh, catechisms, praying to Mary, all that kind of weird stuff that us Protestants just don't really understand. All of that is based on tradition, and uh, if you want to uh, make that a part of uh, your salvation as a requirement, uh, then you've really perverted the gospel of Christ and of grace. Uh, now the legalistic tradition that I want to talk about today is Bible translation. Uh, many people uh, will say that uh, one specific translation stands out as the Word of God and all these others are just uh, phony replications of the actual Word of God. And they don't get it right and they're, they deviate too much from from the, the translation that I'm used to, and so they must be wrong. Um, but what I want you to understand is that uh, everything that we read today is, a, is a, at least a copy, at, at worst a translation, or maybe even a paraphrase. Uh, so what I want to talk about is the King James Bible, obviously. Uh, and I have nothing against the King James Bible. King James did a fantastic work. Because what he essentially did, and this was his purpose, uh, he brought um, the Hebrew text and the Greek text together and translated them into English so that it would be in a language that was common to the people of that time, but yet dignified enough to preach from the pulpit. Uh, so King James did a very excellent work in this. Um, what, uh, what he did was basically make the gospel available to anyone who spoke English. Uh, now for me to say that uh, you have to read that gospel uh, to be able to achieve salvation, if, uh, th that's just foolish uh, because our salvation doesn't depend on a translation. Our salvation obviously, again, depends upon Christ, not any work, not any tradition. So let's talk about the King James Bible. Uh, the King James Bible is also called the Authorized Version of 1611. And we've stated its purpose to translate the original Greek and Hebrew into a common language and yet be dignified enough to preach from the pulpit. Uh, the King James Version was printed initially on two different printers. And when I say a printer, I don't mean a Xerox machine. I mean we use two different scribes, basically. Two different uh, people came up with this copy. And uh, what it amounted to was two different versions because both of the printers did something differently. Both of the scribes um, made their own little additions or uh, errors in transcription. Uh, one of those errors that we see, and this is what identifies those first two versions, is the he-she version in Ruth. Uh, Boaz and Ruth meet on the threshing floor, and after that meeting, uh, one version says she goes back to Jerusalem, the other version says he goes back to Jerusalem. And that's the original King James 1611 version. Okay, now I keep saying the original 1611 version. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the King James has been trans or has been revised several times. Uh, it was revised in 1629, 1638, 1729, 1762, and 1769. Uh, that's the Oxford Standard Edition that we're used to reading from today. So in those first two um, first two versions of the King James Bible, there were over 200 errors between the two different versions, 200 places where they did not agree with one another. Uh, and then we have these major revisions, uh, five in all, uh, that produced the Oxford Standard Edition. And the Oxford Standard Edition differs in at least a thousand places from the original two versions uh, that were created in 1611. Uh, so anybody who holds the King James Version up and says you shouldn't be reading a revised translation, this King James Version that I hold in my hand is the Word of God. Uh, actually, what they are affirming is that a revision is needed uh, because they actually hold in their hand a revised version. Um, and revision is needed. Um, again, the King James purpose was to provide the Bible in a common language that people could understand. And unfortunately, that language that King James spoke over 400 years ago is no longer uh, 
the common language of today. We also see uh, that King James used manuscripts that were not in the quantity that we have them today. And uh, by quantity, I mean, uh, let's talk about how these manuscripts came into being. Initially, we have the prophet or uh, the apostle who writes down the word of God. That's the autograph. But we no longer have those autographs. We don't have the originals. Um, but copies of these letters were made. Copies of, of each of these books of the Bible that we have were made, uh, not only to uh, spread them amongst the people, but also to preserve them. Uh, Jewish tradition was fantastic at uh, preserving their literature, and their scribes uh, were second to none in, in making those copies because they were very, very meticulous. Uh, but even the most meticulous scribe, when copying a, an entire Bible by hand, and remember, we're talking generally the Old Testament initially. Uh, when they're copying that Bible by hand, they are going to make some mistakes. And maybe they see a mistake that another scribe made and they make a revision. Or maybe they even add a little something that they think should have been in there or take away a little something that they think should not have been in there. And this did happen. Now, I'm not saying that these copies that we have now are poor, of poor quality, um, but they are certainly different than the original autograph. And as close as we can get to the autograph, that's where we find um, more agreement uh, with that original autograph. Uh, it's like uh, doing the telephone game, where I tell a secret to someone, and that secret is told to another person, and to another person, and to another person. And by the time that gossip gets all the way across the county, well, it's completely different from what it was when it came out of my mouth. Uh, so. The closer, the older versions, the older copies that we have of these manuscripts ensure us that we have a closer version uh, of one that is in better agreement with the original autograph. Also, the number of copies that we have allows us to lay those two copies alongside one another so that we can look at at the words and see, okay, this scribe, he made this change here, but these five or six scribes, they all agree on this one word. Uh, so it, it enables us to see where maybe one scribe changed something, but the other scribes copied it faithfully. Um, so uh, a large number of copies is helpful, and the older copies are more reliable than the newer copies. King James worked off of a 12th century A.D. copy of the manuscripts. That was the oldest copy that he had. Uh, in 1947, uh, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those Dead Sea Scrolls come from as old as the 2nd century A.D. So they're a thousand years older than anything King James was working with. Uh, and therefore, they are closer to the autograph. They're closer to the original. So we can be assured that those Dead Sea Scrolls are are much more accurate and much more representative of the original wording that the prophet or the apostle wrote down. Also, King James was working with an incomplete copy of the Greek and Hebrew text, and that forced him to take a Latin text that had been translated from Greek um, in the last six verses of Revelation. King James had to take the Septuagint, or the LXX, and translate that back to Greek, and then translate that Greek into Old English. The problem with this is that there's never a one-to-one -one translation. Uh, for instance, uh, there are at least four different words for the, uh, for the Greek word for love. We translate all four words as love, but we miss some of the, the subtle connotations that come along with those Greek words, and the same thing happens with Hebrew. There's not a one-to-one -one translation. So sometimes we, we have to use, it's an art. Translating is an art, and you have to decide which word is correct, and, and um, we just don't have the uh, explicative use of, of the English language that uh, Hebrew and Greek had. Uh, so also we see that King James, again, is, it's just an archaic language. It's not something we speak today. It's not something that we easily understand. Phrases like, I trow not. I don't think any of you know, knows what that means. Uh, it means, I think not. And Paul uses that phrase a couple of times. Uh, Book of Romans would be the first one that comes to mind. Um, and how about, respect him that weareth the gay 
clothing. No, we're not talking about a drag queen. Um, James is actually talking about a finely dressed rich man coming into church and receiving preferential treatment over a poor man, uh, which he condemns. So that archaic language is hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to grasp uh, what the author is trying to tell us when we use those words that are completely out of our vocabulary anymore. Uh, so it's very important that we have an accurate and current translation uh, to be able to understand what, what the prophet, what the apostle really intended to say. And again, I'm not preaching against the King James Version. King James did a fantastic thing in providing a common language Bible to the common man in his day. Unfortunately, that language is no more, no longer common. Um, translations like the ESV, the RSV, the NSV, the NIV, uh, they pull from those Dead Sea Scrolls, and they are in a more um, contemporary language, that's easier to understand. Um, when talked about how the Dead Sea Scrolls are probably a little more accurate than the scrolls that uh, King James was working with. So obviously, for someone to hold up a King James Bible and say to you, if you're not reading this Bible, then you're not reading the Word of God. If you're not preaching from this Bible, you're not preaching from the Word of God. And for anyone to say, if you were truly saved, you would be able to understand this King James version of the Bible, that's heresy. I will stand very strongly against that issue, not against any person who says so, but against that issue. I always want to come to you with love and with respect, um, but if you're going to uh, assert any kind of truth, especially in regards to translation, you need to be able to back it up, and that's just not one that anybody can back up. The King James Version is a translation of the Bible, and it was a pretty good translation for its time. Uh, it, it's no, it no longer holds its weight. Uh, so my advice to you would be to pick a translation of the Bible that you can understand, that you will read. And it's very, very important that you read. And I want to tell you this, God is a relational God from the beginning to the end of this Bible. It's all about a relationship. God created man and woman, and then he took a rest. And the reason he took a rest after the day he created them was so he could spend time with them. Uh, but then we sinned, and that caused that relationship to be broken. And ever since, God has been setting in, into place the plan of redemption for that relationship. And that redemption comes through the cross of Christ, through the grace that he gives us, through the faith that enables us to believe in him, not through any works, not by anything that we can do, because if we could earn our salvation, then Christ died in vain. So pick out a good translation and please read it. Um, just a little here and there. You don't have to feel like you, you need to be committed to reading a chapter a day or to reading the Bible in a year. Sit down and just read a passage, pray through it, maybe read it a couple of times before you move on to the next passage so that God can speak to you through it. Uh, but definitely don't let your Bible collect dust. Don't let it sit in your rigging bag and just pull it out whenever you think you need God's protection for your bull ride or for your bronc ride or whatever it might be. Um, be in the Word. Be relational with God. That's what He wants from you. He wants a relationship with you. Um, one thing I will say is if you're going to use a paraphrase uh, such as the message, um, don't be afraid to do that. I'm okay with that, but certainly don't do it without also reading the same verses in an actual translation because a paraphrase is just uh, is just that. It, it's just a loosely worded um, idea of what the, the prophet or the apostle might have been saying, and it's not the actual words, and the actual words can be very, very important at times. Uh, so uh, just want to um, ask you, please, Get inside your Bible. Go cover to cover on it. Don't worry about doing it in a year, but maybe start with uh, Mark. Mark is a great to-the-point gospel. There's not a lot of fluff to it, uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you uh, don't necessarily like Mark, John is a very theologically uh, robust gospel, and it's great to read. Uh, gives you the exact idea of what God's redemption plan is. Uh, so uh, if you're new to reading the Bible, I would suggest uh, starting with Mark or John. Uh, but definitely get inside your Bible. Uh, blessings and peace to you. And I hope this message uh, finds a, a soft heart.
and, and an ear that is ready to hear.